Good morning. It's time for us to get started with our Bible class. Glad to have you in here this morning. In just a minute, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4. But let's start off this morning with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Almighty God, our Father, we are so grateful for the blessings that you give. Thank you that we can be here today, gathered as your people to worship you, to study and learn and encourage one another. We pray that you will bless our time together, that everything we do will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. God, as we come in, we are mindful of those who aren't able to be with us. We have those of our number that are sick. We pray that you would be with them. Pray that you would continue to be with John West and with Donna Muster and bless them with healing and Father, we also know there are those that fight a more long-term battle, and we pray that you would bless our sick and our shut-ins. I pray that you would give them strength and courage to go through the days. We pray, Father, that, that you would also give them healing, that they could get back to the life that they want to lead. And God, as we also look around, we are mindful of just the brokenness of this world and the pain and the heartache of so many around us, and it just makes us long all the more for heaven. Thank you for the promise that you've given us, for the hope that we have. Thank you for the knowledge that life in you is where we need to be. We pray that you will help us to live that way each and every day. As we look into your word this morning, we ask for wisdom and guidance. And God, as we study that Christian life, we pray that we'll have the courage to apply what we've learned and live it out. Guide us and watch over us in Jesus' name. Amen. We left off in Ephesians chapter 4. Paul had given us this list of one things, things that, that unify the body. And so there at the, in verse 4, he said, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. And then he turns around and he says, but, and that seems like a really weird thing. Here's all the great things God has done, the, the things that God does to unify us. And he says, but to each one of us, grace was given. Well, wouldn't you think that would be a, a unifying thing? Wouldn't you think, you know, if he's going to talk about God's grace, well, God's grace is given to all of us. And yet he, he goes very, he's very specifically says to each one of us, grace was given. And, and he's going to talk about now some ways that, that we are different, the things that make us unique in the body of Christ. And, and so he talked about all the, the gifts that God has given that unify us. And then he says, to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. What does that mean, according to the measure of Christ's gift? What is the gift of Christ in this context? Sorry. JV. Salvation, you know, we've talked about that, the one gifts, the, the things that unify us, and that salvation. And we talked about Jesus being our one Lord. But what does Christ give to each one of us in a unique way? The Holy Spirit, there's a commonality there. We did talk about the one Spirit. I think here, as Paul's going to talk about, and, and as we move into the, these gifts that he's going to discuss... These are what we might call talents. These are things that, that you might have that I might not. Ways that you and I are different within the body of Christ. We talked about there's one body and there's one head, but you know what? Some, you know, there's a hand and there's also a foot and an elbow, and they're not the same thing. And so in the body of Christ, there are differences. And so to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. But what is Christ's gift? And JB said it is salvation. We're going to see that in just a moment and see what Christ gave as salvation. And within that salvation, there is room for diversity. It makes the body stronger. And so Paul said, it's given according to the measure of Christ. And here's why I think that's important. He, he said earlier that God gives measure according to his power. And here he says he gives us these gifts according to Christ's gift. He gives us his grace. It's not up to you or me. We don't sit down and take a grace test and however well we score, well, that's how much grace we get. It's not up to us. We're given according to the measure of Christ. And of course, it was Christ who gave everything, who held nothing back. 
And here, as we talk about the church, he gave to the church everything that was needed. It was a gift given in grace. It wasn't earned. It wasn't merited. It was given freely. And Paul is going to talk about these gifts and, and use it in the context of a, a victory that was won, that, that Christ had to, to work for that. And he says in verse 8, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He led captivity captive, or he led captive a host of captives. When Christ, in order to be able to, to give that grace to us, there were things he had to overcome. He had to overcome sin and death and the power of Satan. And all those things he overcame. And when he conquered those things, he, he took them captive. The reference there, the idea is he led captivity captive. It has reference to a, a parade, if you will. And it simply is designed to emphasize the total dominance. Now, I didn't set this up for this weekend, but if you're a basketball fan and uh, you know that I love my Vols and, and I, nothing, nothing makes me renounce my love for the Vols, but you want to talk about total dominance, that basketball game this weekend was total dominance. And uh, Kentucky put a whooping on us. And as I thought about, you know, he led captivity captives, this idea of he, he has totally dominated. And, and my mind immediately went back to uh, that Kentucky-Tennessee game. But here it says he led captivity captive. In other words, he didn't just win. He won convincingly. The idea here is Rome that would put their captives on display. And when Rome did that, when they led captives through the square and all that, it was to emphasize how great Rome was. And here's Jesus leading these captives. What are we designed to, what's, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to realize how great Jesus is. And as he leads these captives through, he gives gifts. He is the, the great, this is the language that they would have understood of a Roman emperor. And here's Jesus doing that very thing. He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, and Paul, here you get a little glimpse into how Paul understands Scripture. And by the way, as he quotes that Scripture, it's from Psalm 68 that, that he quotes from. Verse 9, now with this, he ascended. What does it mean? but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. It's almost a, a parenthetical statement. And he says, to say that he ascended means that, that Christ descended from heaven. To say that he descended is to say that he lived on earth. Paul is adamant that one of the stipulations uh, of the faith is that you have to believe Jesus Christ showed up in the flesh and that he was the Son of God, fully human, and, and that that is, that is mandatory to understand for the faith. In order for Christ to give gifts to the church, in order for Christ to have died for the church, he had to be fully present there. There was a teaching, a heretical teaching, in, in Paul's day amongst Christians, and, and certainly not long after it, it really took root, that said that, that Jesus was a man and God sort of took him over for a while. That, that at his baptism, God sort of took him over and then right before he died on the cross, God abandoned him so that God never died. The man Jesus died. And the early church branded that heresy immediately as well they should. That, that's not what scripture said. The death that was died on the cross had to be a substitutionary atonement. It had to be able to pay for our sins. And if any man died for our sins, it wouldn't work. But the Son of God who gave his life for our sins, he descended to earth. And so as he says there, he descended to earth again. And then he goes on, he says, to, to, to explain that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. I'm just going to tell you, you're getting into some heavy theology there and some ideas of philosophy as well as exactly what that means. Clearly, Paul refers to the fact that Christ died for our sins. And he's talking about that time period, those three days that Jesus was dead. And he, so he, he's, he descended as low as we can go. As much as you want to understand all of that and, and Christ being uh, in Hades or in hell, and there's a lot of debate about all of that, I think we can just safely say Christ died. He suffered death. Everything that had to, do, to go with death, he suffered for us. 
He descended into the lower parts of the earth, and he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens. It's the same person. You can't differentiate between them. The one who died on the cross is the one who was exalted at the right hand of God, that he might fill all things. What Paul says about Christ's exaltation, his universal rule, it all reminds us that Christ was God. It opened the way for him to, to fill the universe in every aspect as the supreme ruler. And in all of that, Paul uses that, and that's almost an aside. He says, I want you to know Jesus came and he took sin and death captive, and he paraded them around and he gave gifts as he did. And By the way, the one who descended was the Son of God. He died, he was in the lowest parts of the earth, and he went back to heaven. And Paul says, now let's talk about those gifts he gave. All of everything he said there was just designed to show us that Christ gave gifts to men. Verse 11 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And the sentence goes on, but let's stop there for just a moment. This is Paul. He, uh, he doesn't really like periods. He's a big fan of commas. You just kind of keep on going. Paul says he himself gave. These are those gifts that Christ gave, the gifts that the church enjoys. And what, what were the gifts that Christ gave? People, yes, that's important. Christ, the gifts that he gave to the church were people. He put the right people in the right place. Paul's going to say that, that we're all exactly where God wants us to be in the church, that he positions every member of the body exactly where he wants it. And here he says he gives gifts, and the gifts he gives are people. So these are gifts that the church has. And the first one he names is apostles. It was Christ himself who took his, his group of disciples and then selected 12 of them to be his 12 apostles. A disciple is a student. Jesus invited lots of folks to be his disciple, to follow him, to be a student of his. But he picked 12 of his students and he sent them out in a unique way and he named them apostles. And so when we talk about apostles, there's a couple of different ways that we can talk about it. Because an apostle is a messenger. And, and there are other folks in Scripture who will claim to be an apostle. In fact, if you go and look at that title, there's a whole lot more than 12 apostles. But there are 12 that Jesus handpicked that were with him for his ministry. And, and Peter in, in Acts, when they have to replace Judas, says here's the qualifications to be one of those apostles. Traditionally... And this is our way of doing things, okay? Traditionally, we've designated those folks as apostles with a capital A. That, 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 that's a proper name that refers to that group. In fact, Scripture kind of does that because it'll refer to the 12. And we know who he's talking about, who Scripture is talking about when they talk about the 12. And, and so he gave apostles. When Christ selected his 12 apostles, they met those qualifications. They were witnesses of the resurrection, they, they had performed, they'd been with Christ as he performed miracles. They were, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, we know. They were empowered to receive and communicate Christ's message. And they confirmed that message with miracles themselves. The apostles were those who could impart the gift to do miracles. They could lay their hands on others and impart that gift to them. The term apostle, again, it just simply means one sent. But it, it has a mission. What was the mission of the 12 apostles? Spread the gospel. What were the words? Christ gave them their mission. And you're right, Colby, but, but specifically, what was it? Go into all the world. It's Matthew 28. It's the, what we call the Great Commission. That was their mission. And, and he gave that to them. And, and if you notice in the Great Commission, it's go into all the world and, and preach the gospel, you teach them, you baptize them, and you teach them to obey all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So here's the apostles, and you go out and you make disciples. And you make disciples by baptizing them and teaching them to obey all things I've commanded you. 
Well, you know what one of those commands is? Go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them and teach them to obey. And so it becomes this cycle. Those 12 apostles take that mission and they run with it. But if it was just given to them when the apostles died, the mission is over. But it wasn't because they taught disciples to, who were baptized and, and who then did everything that Jesus commanded. And so it's go and make disciples and teach them to go and make disciples and teach them to go and make disciples. And that's how come you and I can be Christians today. You know, I've shared this before in a couple of different settings, but it's kind of interesting to think about your spiritual family tree. Genealogy is a big thing, and you can look up your ancestry and heritage, and you can check out your DNA and all that kind of stuff and find out where you came from physically. But spiritually, won't it be neat one day in heaven to be able to say, hey, I'm a Christian, and you can trace it back a thousand years and say, here was somebody who made a really difficult decision to come to Christ in a difficult time, and it opened up this whole branch of the tree of the family of God, and I was part of it. And those, there's those stories that, that we don't even know. In the Old Testament, as you trace God's promise all the way from the Garden of Eden forward, when he gives Eve that seed promise, your seed will crush the head of Satan, there are moments in the Old Testament when the promise gets down to one person. Just one person is left alive who can carry on that promise. And in every situation, God provides and protects to make sure. What were you going to say? Why do I think Jesus picked, we talk about that, you know, he gave some to be apostles, and that's right, you know, Judas is one of those apostles. Um, and, and you already referenced, there was a prophecy that, that would be fulfilled. We know that Judas made his own, um, his own decision. Peter says that Judas by transgression fell, so Judas was responsible for that decision. He chose to sin, to betray Christ. Um, I think Jesus chose Judas because Judas had that choice and, and that there was an opportunity for Judas to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. And, and if that had happened, someone else would have fulfilled that prophecy. God knew that prophecy was going to happen and come true. But, but Judas had a choice. And, and you know, some have, have said if you looked at all the apostles and, and listed their qualifications, man, you could find problems with a lot of them. And I wonder what Judas's resume would have looked like. Maybe he's the one that everybody said, now that's the guy you need. He handles money really well. He's got some smarts about him, some political savvy. Jesus, you need Judas. Who knows? I don't know. But Jesus knew Judas. He knew Judas all along. He knew what was in a man. He, he seems to even reach out to Judas. And at the moment Judas makes up his mind, that's when he says, you know what, what you do, do quickly. And so, but I, I think Judas is a representative of all of us. You know, Judas and Peter both betrayed Christ. Peter comes back from it. Judas does not. Um, so, again, it, it represents, and this is all in the situation here in Ephesians of the grace that Christ gave. He showed Judas some grace. Judas refused it, but he showed Judas some grace. We have the apostles and so he gave the church apostles, and then he says he gave the church prophets. And in some ways, those are very similar to one another. Prophets tended to refer to more to that Old Testament example, although you have New Testament prophets as well. Uh, just so you know, the, in the Gospels and in Acts as well, you run into folks who have that gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy we tend to think of is, I can predict the future. But what was the most common thing that a prophet said? Thus saith the Lord. Yeah, he spoke the words of God. The most common thing a prophet said was, Thus saith the Lord. Now, it might be, and that's my old King James coming through, but it might be that he says, Here's a message from God, and I'm telling you what's fixing to happen in the future. Sometimes it was, Here's what God said all those years ago, and you haven't lived according to the promises that you made. And he would go back to the scriptures. He didn't tell him anything new. In fact, all he said was, God made some promises back there, and so did you. And part of God's promises says, if you break your promise, if you don't stay faithful to me, here's some things that are going to happen. And a prophet showed up and said, God's going to do what he promised he'd do all the time ago. And so a prophet was simply one who said, here's the word of the Lord. 
Sometimes that was given in a miraculous way that predicted the future. Other times it simply directed us to the Word of God. The apostles and the prophets for the church represent the Scriptures. The words of the apostles, in fact, in the New Testament church, when it, when it talks about them continuing steadfastly in the doctrine of the apostles, they, they continued in the teaching of the apostles. And the prophets is a great way to sum up the teaching of the Old Testament. So one of the gifts that Christ gave the church is the scriptures. That, that we were, were given those scriptures. God inspired the scriptures. He preserved the scriptures. Think about this. When Jesus shows up, when Jesus is walking around, and there's all these folks there who are godly Jewish people, they have copies of copies of copies of copies of thousand years, thousands of years old manuscripts that are the scriptures. The, the Jews had a, a specific class of scribes whose job was just to copy the scriptures, and they were meticulous. They counted the number of lines on a page, and they counted the number of letters in each line, and they double-checked to count what the middle letter of each line was. And as they copied a page of Scripture, they would triple-check to make sure that everything was as accurate as possible. And folks always wondered, that they were the Masoretes, by the way. That was their, the, the title of that group of Jews, the, the Masoretic Jews. And everybody wondered, how did the Masoretes do? How well did they really do? And it, it wasn't too long ago in terms of history that a couple of shepherd boys were throwing rocks into a cave and they heard something break and they didn't know if they were in trouble or if they'd found something cool. And they climbed up in the caves at Qumran and they found these Dead Sea Scrolls, manuscripts of the Old Testament that were more than a thousand years older than the, older, the best ones we had access to. And what they found were very, very, I mean, virtually no changes in our text of the scripture, the Masoretes were careful and they did a really good job. Even in Jesus' day, the scriptures were not just revered as inspired, but also as preserved by God. God's people understood they had a job to do. Today, there is more evidence that Jesus Christ existed as a human being than that Julius Caesar existed as a human being. There is more evidence that Paul wrote the letters that he wrote than that William Shakespeare wrote the plays that bear his name. The church has always understood that there is an obligation with that gift that was given. That, that we understand the Bible was inspired by God. We also understand he wants it preserved and the church has worked hard to make sure that the scriptures are preserved. And so when you read your Bibles, you can have confidence in what you're reading. Because God was active, not just to inspire those original manuscripts, but through centuries, God has made sure that his word is available. When Paul says he gave apostles and prophets, and is talking about, there about the scriptures, that gift is not just to the first century church. It's not just to those Jews who were alive in Moses' day when he wrote Genesis through, uh, through Deuteronomy, but it is to God's people throughout time. That gift is one that he continues to give. And, and so you can trust your Bibles. He gave apostles, he gave prophets, and he gave some to be evangelists. The evangelist is the title of a person. When you use that as a, a noun for an object, it's euangelion. It's the word we translate gospel. So an evangelist is one who preaches the gospel, one who brings good tidings. So here you have one who, who preaches the gospel. In the New Testament, Philip is called an evangelist. Timothy was told to do the work of an evangelist. So there's two folks that are given that title evangelist. Does that exempt the rest of the church from evangelism? Okay, good. I was kind of thinking, wait a minute now, surely we got this part down. It doesn't exempt the rest of the church from evangelism at all. We talk about spiritual gifts, and some folks are gifted 
with the ability to, man, they, they just, they are talented at loving on folks, especially broken people. They step into situations and, and they have a, a heart that is empathetic and, and they can do things that are incredible. Oftentimes they end up in a field like counseling or something else where, where they can do a lot of good. Does the fact that some folks are gifted at that exempt the rest of us from loving everyone? No, not at all. And so here, I do want to make that point. There are some gifted evangelists. There are those who, who could stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach the gospel in a way that, that made it easy to understand, so much so that 3,000 would obey the gospel. But that didn't stop any of the rest of them from sharing the gospel as well. He gave, him, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists. So he gave the message. He gave some who share the message. And some he gave as pastors and teachers. Now, there's some discussion about this. And, and I told you Paul loves commas more than he does periods. You know there's no punctuation marks in the Greek manuscripts. But uh, if Paul wanted to weigh in on the Oxford comma debate, this would be the spot to look at it, all right? The Oxford comma is whether we separate something before the word and or not, whether you put that comma in there. If you're an English nerd, you know about that debate. Here's how it applies here. Some folks say Paul's talking about two different people here. There are some who are gifted as pastors and some who are gifted as teachers. Other folks say that word and doesn't have a comma in there, and these are pastor teachers. They are pastors and teachers. That, that is their combined role. David's personal opinion, while I love the Oxford comma in English, is that this is one person. And this is two aspects of that same job that they do. The word pastor in the New Testament describes one specific role in the church. Anybody know what we call that role here? Elder, shepherd. Yeah, I say it's a shepherd. That's what that word means. And we call those folks elders here. Um, I've shared this before. In the world today, typically, they think the guy who stands up and preaches Sunday is the pastor, and that's how they use that word. And I understand how it's used in our world today. But if you want to speak biblically, this is the role of a shepherd, an elder. Peter is going to say that, that he is a shepherd of God's church, and he writes and he says, The elders who are among you I exhort as a fellow shepherd. So he says, here's, that, you know, here, here's those two titles, and, and he uses them together there. And Peter also reminds elders that they are shepherds, but he uses, he creates a word. He says, y'all are under shepherds. We're all under shepherds. The elders are shepherds, but they serve the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And so here he says, Paul says that Christ gave the church pastors and teachers. Christ gave the church elders. One of the qualifications Paul gives for an elder is that they are apt to teach. And I remember one of the one of the great elders I've had a privilege of working with, he says, you know, it seems like if a man was apt to teach, and the idea there is that he has the ability to teach, that he'd do it. So the idea that here's an elder, he's apt to teach, he's never done it, but he's apt to, that's not what Paul's talking about. In fact, here, Paul can so identify those two roles together that he says to shepherd the flock, to take care of the flock, naturally involves education. You know, in certain fields, we get this today. If you get a degree in medicine or education or engineering or law, lots of those different fields, and there's a lot more. Many of you guys will identify with this. You get your degree and you get your certification, and what does your certificate come with? There's an expiration date on the bottom of it. And what do you have to do to change the date on that expiration? Continuing education, yeah, you got to take a test. you, you got to take more classes. We understand, especially in certain fields, you're never done learning. And, and so even in the world today, we appreciate the fact that, that you don't learn it all in college, get your degree, and boom, you never learn it, anything else again. You just practice from there on out. Well, that's what, what it's like to be a Christian as well. You don't have to answer every single question and know it all to be a Christian. Those folks on the day of Pentecost heard Peter's sermon. They had grown up Jewish. They had some background in the word of God. Peter opened their minds and they became a Christian. You know what they did after that? They continued meeting together and learning. And God provided shepherds who taught. 
those who, who shepherded the flock, who cared for the flock, there, there's an element of protection there, an element of provision there that shepherds provide. And part of that is that they are teachers, educators to the flock. By the way, the word pastor there is literally poimain that means shepherd. It comes into Latin as pastor. That's where we get it, uh, our title today. And so here are these elders in the church. Elders were appointed in every church. Acts 14 tells us that, that, that there was a, an eldership in every church. Paul talks to Timothy and Titus and said, here's the qualifications for an elder and for a deacon. And as the church has matured, it was God's plan always that each church would, would be taken care of by pastors, by a group of elders who would shepherd the flock that meets at that location. Paul is also going to talk, uh, actually it's to the Ephesian elders that Paul says, shepherd the flock of which God has made you overseers. So, so those pastors had a specific flock that they were responsible for. And here, as Paul talks about gifts that he gives the church, Paul's given some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So these are gifts that he's given to the church. And then he says, here's why I gave those gifts to the church. Here's why the church needs those things. For the edifying, I'm sorry, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. That's a powerful uh, passage right there. Paul says, you have apostles and prophets and, and pastor teachers so that the saints can be equipped to do the ministry of the church. Who is it that's supposed to be doing the ministry of the church? All Christians, that's right. It is, a, as one of my mentors used to say, it's the whole job of the whole church to preach the whole gospel to the whole world. And every Christian has that responsibility. Just like we talked about with evangelists there, that the, the fact that some are gifted at sharing that doesn't exempt any of us from the obligation of doing the work of ministry. Paul says ministry, and by the way, the word for ministry there is the word for a servant, the work of a servant. We're all servants of Christ. And the, the servant, the, the job that we do, it is work. Paul wants to make sure we understand that. It is, it is work, and it's work that requires equipment. The word that is for, that's translated equipment there, katartismos, it's only used here in the New Testament. It means the act of making fully ready. It means that, that the church needs to be given the right equipment, the right ability in order to do the ministry. It is to be prepared. So how does the church prepare to do the work of ministry? We're educating ourselves, that's right. The church prepares to do the work of ministry by spending time with the apostles and prophets in the word of God, by spending time with evangelists who proclaim the gospel, by spending time with those pastor teachers who help us to grow in our knowledge of God's word. And, and so when we gather in gatherings like this to study it's for the purpose of doing the work of ministry. Can you imagine a Christian who said, I just want to study. I want to be a perpetual student. Now, on the one hand, you say, well, we should always be students. But he said, no, no, you don't understand. I just want to spend all my time with my nose in a book, reading and learning. I don't want to have anybody bother me. I don't want to have to get my study interrupted. I just want to study the word of God until I die. He's missed something, right? He's fully gotten the whole, I need to be growing and learning, but he's missed the fact that it's for the purpose of doing the work of ministry. Acts 8, 4. I'm going to go look it up. Yeah, there you go. Uh, as Saul is preaching against uh, the church, this is when Saul is still persecuting the church, and it says, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, and that's how I get introed to Philip. That's right, that's a good point. That's how we get our introduction to Philip, who is called the evangelist. But everyone who was scattered went everywhere. As the church faced persecution, it ended up being the fertilizer that the gospel needed to spread throughout the world. Because everywhere the Christians ran to, they took the gospel with them. And so as much as Rome or the Jews thought they were stamping out the church, they were actually spreading it everywhere. And so that, that's a, I didn't have that verse in my notes, but that's a great reminder. 
So he says here the work that the church does is the work of ministry. All of us do that. And then he says for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying means the building up, the encouragement, the strengthening of the body of Christ. So there is the work of ministry. That's the work of service. That is an outward focused work. The idea there is, again, that as the church goes, they they carry the gospel with them. So the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, also for the edifying of the body of Christ, there is an inward focus. So uh, sometimes the church has church has been known to be rather myopic, rather inwardly focused and not looking outward enough. And, and certainly we need to be reminded there is work of ministry, work of service to be done. The church should go out. But there is also, from the very beginning, a time when the church gathered together and studied and learned and grew and encouraged one another. There is an edification, a building up of the body that is as much a part of the ministry of the church as anything else. And so while you see some churches that get all inwardly focused and they forget about the world outside, you'll also see some Christians usually who say, you know what, I don't go to church. I don't need to be part of a church. I just work and serve. They've got the outward focus, but they don't ever build up the body of Christ, nor are they themselves built up by the body of Christ because they don't ever gather with the body of Christ. And Paul says both of those are roles that the church should fill. Equip the saints for the work of ministry. Edify the body of Christ. And there's a reason for the edification of the body of Christ. Verse 13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And there's your period in the New King James. That's a lot. But Paul says the church is designed to to do the work of ministry and also to edify the body. And he says that's designed to bring about a unity of faith. So how does that work? How does edifying the body bring about a unity of faith? Yes, sir. There is an edification there. Yeah, like the We Care sheet that says, hey, here's, here's folks that, that we care about, and that's an opportunity we get to send some cards. There's, there's a unity there, especially those We Care sheets are focused on folks who aren't able to be with us. And so, yeah, there, there's an edification there that reminds everybody that says, hey, we're part of the body of Christ, even for some of our shut-ins, for folks who aren't able to gather with us. There's a unity of the faith that says we're one. There's a unity of the faith that when we get together, that simply says as we gather together, there's a unity because we're, we're all coming together for the same reason, for the same purpose. As we do those works of service, the works of ministry, There's a unity that happens. Show up on a VBS work night, and I'm telling you, there's a unity that happens. We're all in this together. It might be 930 at night, and we're still painting sides of a pyramid, but there's a unity that happens, right, in those works of service. As we do our outreach projects, there's a a unity that happens. Perhaps, I, I think here recently, We've seen this an awful lot following the tornado as churches have bonded together and, and done outreach and, and, and worked out through Churches of Christ disaster relief and other things. All of those things ha, have helped bring about that unity of the faith. So the work of ministry, the edifying of the body, it brings us a unity of faith. It also means, by the way, we don't start out with that. We grow into that. Brand new Christians certainly don't always get along, and sometimes they still struggle with pride and and, and even with division, and sometimes they choose to to fight over unity and harmony. And and if you think about it, we know how children grow up, and we know they don't always choose unity and harmony in the same family, right? And and so there's a maturity there, and that's what Paul says. Until we all come to unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, The key to unity is Jesus. 
the more, the more knowledge of the Son of God I have, the more unity we'll find. Because we can agree on Jesus. And that leads us to a perfect man. Anybody here perfect? I thought Brenda was going to raise her hand. She reared that elbow back just for a second. <laughs> It's not perfect in the sense of sinless. The idea there is mature. And there is an element of, and that's what Paul's going to talk about. What is a perfect man? He's going to say, and you look all the way down at the end there in verse 16, the growth of the body. And he's also going to say, or is it verse 15, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So, so there is a, a maturity that comes. You know, somebody who's been a Christian for a long time, who's been an active, faithful Christian, who's growing in their faith, has learned a lot of lessons. And, and they'll be the first one to tell you, man, when I was a brand new Christian, when I was in my 20s, when I was in my 30s, when I was in my 40s, they'd look back and they'd say, you know, I've learned a lot since then. And, and a wise person would learn from their experience, but, but most of us have to be able to, learn from our own mistakes instead. But I think that's part of why when Paul talks about those elders, those pastor teachers, he says, not a novice, because they'll, they'll fall away. They can be tempted into pride. But here he says that, that there's a maturity. And again, the New King James translates that to a perfect man. It's simply the idea of a, a completion. Not that I'm done, but, but that I understand I have grown into a maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So as we look to attain this unity of faith, this knowledge of the Son of God, we'll grow into a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. None of us will ever fully attain. You know, we, we all say, I want to be like Christ. Well, none of us is ever going to reach 100% on that goal. Last week, as we talked about, if you tried to make faith part of your to-do list, if you put Jesus on the to-do list, you've got a real problem. What's that? If Jesus is on your to-do list, there's only one place you can put him on the to-do list. What number goes beside his name? One. Because how could you ever say, well, the fifth thing I'm going to do today is try to be like Jesus. He's got to be first. And so if I put Jesus first on my to-do list, what happens to the number two item on my to-do list? Absolutely nothing. Because you never draw that line through Jesus and say, okay, I got him marked off. Now let's go on to number two. That's why faith can't be part of a to-do list. And so when we talk about being perfect, it's not this idea that I can finally draw a line through Jesus and say, okay, I got it. No, what we attain is a measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We, we grow to, to reflect him more. And when that happens, then we're no longer children. We grow up. And Paul's going to even use that word. And what does it mean we're no longer children? tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. It doesn't mean that we're just always saying, hey, what's the latest, greatest thing? You know, what are the talking heads saying? I want to do what everybody else is doing. There's a maturity that the church grows into. And as Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, it was certainly uh, an urgent thing. All the churches were brand new. And we understand that, that God gave some gifts of wisdom and maturity to the early church because they didn't have anybody yet who had those gifts. And now, how do we get those gifts of wisdom and maturity? Study, yeah. Uh, one of those gifts that God gave immediately was the ability to learn language or to speak languages you hadn't studied. On the day of Pentecost, God gave that, that ability to, to speak in languages that they hadn't studied so that everybody could hear the gospel. How do you and I get the ability to speak in languages that we haven't studied? We study them, that's right. We have the ability to study and to learn, and we are thankful for folks who have done that, and we can learn from them, and those gifts carry on generation to generation. We're going to take a look. We'll pick up in verse 14 and talk a little bit more about that maturity next week and what it grow up into Christ. Thanks for being in Bible class this morning.